Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first Department of Medicine Grand Rounds for the 2024-2025 academic year. I am Edward. I'm one of the chief, I am, re I am chief residents. I'll be in part hosting Grand Rounds for this year. I'm very excited to, to be here, very excited to help out. As you all know, Grand Rounds occurs every Thursday at 8 a.m. right here in Clopton Auditorium. Um, so please tell your friends, tell your family, tell everyone. We want uh, to come and support and show support for all of our fantastic speakers. We have an exciting schedule planned for the year. Um, we have speakers from all across America, even across the pond as well, who are, will be coming and share and talk about their passions and uh, their research and whatever excites them. But no better way to start Grand Rounds and actually bring it back here at home, uh, here at WashU, and and highlight some of the amazing work that our third year in Tome Medicine residents have been doing and let, give them the space to talk about projects and, excuse me, projects and topics that they are very passionate about. So starting us off today is Dr. Justin Vincent. Uh, Dr. Vincent uh, went actually here to Wash U for undergrad. He majored in, what was it? Cognitive neuroscience, so that's why I had to double check it. Uh, cognitive neuroscience, and then went to Baylor in Houston for medical school where he achieved his medical degree. And of course came here for residency. Uh, he's currently applying to cardiology fellowship, so everyone in cardiology, please keep an eye out because you definitely want to keep him on board. Um, and he has a very exciting talk today about the ethics in advanced heart failure. Please, go ahead. Hello, hello, hello. All right. This thing. Is there a way to do a little? What's up? Oh, that might help. Perfect. Okay. Well, thank you everyone for coming. Um, so my topic is: Last Christmas, I gave you my heart. The ethics of heart failure. Um, We've got this nice AI-generated image of someone giving someone their heart, it's very heartfelt, and my name is Justin. So uh, there will be a lot of AI-generated images kind of throughout this, because I did not want to pay any copyright fees. So by the end of this talk, I would really like everyone to at least be able to outline one framework for approaching ethical situations, um, pretty much broadly. This can be applied to anything. I also want you to identify that there's a wide variety in how to approach this. There's not one right answer. And then specifically when it comes to advanced heart failure, identify some of the key ethical factors that make it kind of a little more specialized for this type of management. So we got to start somewhere. Let's start with some terms. Uh, this might be a refresher for folks, but uh, this is the heart. It is a pump. It circulates blood, oxygen in. All right, thank you. And ethics is basically like having a tiny nagging voice in your head. Make sure you don't take candy from a baby, even when no one is looking. So essentially, that's really it. Like, that's the entire talk. That's all I had. Uh, I will recuse my time. And uh, yeah, so basically, the, the basic topics are very simple. Do good, do no harm. Autonomy, everyone knows, is just the idea of a right, and that will come back later, for someone to make an informed decision on their own behalf. And then distributive justice is a specific type of uh, justice, which is doing something fair and just. In this case, distributing all the benefits and all the burdens in a, across society in a way that is equitable. So that will really come into play when we're talking about heart failure. And again, this is all of these will be AI unless I did otherwise. But uh, it's a full heart on an ethics book, and I think that's kind of gross, but this is, how, this is how this came to be. All right, so ethics workup. Basically, this is going to be kind of the soap note format of how I approach ethical concerns. This is something that I learned at Baylor, where there's an ethics pathway and an ethics center. This is something that they developed. Uh, it is just one way to approach it. Uh, Carl, uh, Dr. Wallenkamp, uh, is a big proponent of the four boxes approach, which is an awesome, equally valid way to approach this, but this is just the way I do it um, when I'm on the ethics consult service. So it's basically a soap note. So you want to start with your subjective and your objective. That's your fact finding. That's just going to be everything that you know now, everything that you want to know, everything that you have to take into account when you're going forward. And then you identify your alternatives. And that could be as simple as 
offer the treatment, not offer the treatment, you know, do nothing, palliation, things like that. And then the most important part when you're kind of fleshing out this differential is assessing each alternative. And I think this is where kind of the, the real you know, focus of this workup is. If there's any legal, ethical, or professional standards, you should apply those. You know, if there's any like guidelines, you should definitely make sure that you're following that, make sure you're doing standard of care. If there's any consequences when it comes to like, is this a life or death situation? Is this, uh, are there any rights at play? Of course, you know, autonomy is one of those rights. Virtues such as honesty, justice as we kind of talked about, and we'll talk about a little bit more. Any special obligations to the professional role, and that could be as a provider, as a physician, um, anyone that has, you know, within the job themselves obligations to kind of do, do the best by their patient. And of course, uh, it's legitimate self-interest. This could be your own, this could be the patients, this could be the families, this could be the hospital system at large. Everyone's kind of got their own stakeholder elements to that. And then finally, some general moral constraints. I, I'm not going to be the first one to tell you to not kill people and not to steal, but it's important that, that you factor those in. And if, you're, if you approach this the same way every single time, you'll make sure you're not missing anything. Then, of course, you develop a plan and an argument. Then you want to say, this is why I think this should be the case. Let's, let's talk about it. And then eventually end with some prevention steps, which I think is really important because that is the way to prevent you know, similar situations from happening in the future. Also, if there's ethical situations, either on firm or in an ICU, this is an ongoing thing as more information kind of develops that you want to make sure that you are identifying. So there you are, setting ethics. So, to get a little more into the idea of distributive justice when it comes to organ transplantation, at its core, it is a supply and demand mismatch. There are more people who need uh, new organs or new devices than there are those things available in the world for whatever reason. It could be um, just a, an organ standpoint, which is always an issue, and there's some unethical practices around the world where they're trying to mitigate that, and there can be exploitative practices, which is unfortunate. Um, but also, not everyone who is eligible to get a heart or device is going to, you know, know that you're going to do well with it afterwards. So a lot of what they do when there's a heart, you know, uh, transplant meeting with everyone sitting in a nice table with some succulents and a uh, big TV that, I don't know what the 33 is, but uh, that's a little alarming actually. But um, everyone's going to kind of decide, hey, what are the factors that actually is going to make this person a good candidate? Uh, I've been lucky to sit in on some of these. It's, it's a lively discussion. It's, it's cardiologists, surgeons, pharmacists, social workers, dietitians, whole gamut, both in person and over Zoom, to try to make sure that they're doing the right thing by this patient. It's all these factors, medical and otherwise, you know, social support, things like that, that goes into these decisions to make sure that if you're going to give someone this, this uh, life-saving thing, is this going to be the right person for it, and how can you predict that? All right. So let's apply that kind of discussion to the ethics workup. So fact finding, it's kind of every, every you know, subjective, objective thing that you talk about, anatomic things, surgical things, social facts. Um, you could do kind of stay the course. You can do nothing. You can change nothing about what's going on. You can offer full palliation. You can offer a device like a mechanical circulatory support, an impella, LVAD, things like that, um, all the way to transplant or things kind of along that spectrum. Um, when you're assessing the alternatives, I was noting that a lot of folks are talking about the consequences of what happens when we don't do this. What happens, you know, are we making sure that the right person is getting this? So that's the justice and the consequences. And you want to advocate for your patient's course. This is something that anyone that kind of offers uh, this person in a, a transplant meeting is, is advocating for their course. And then while they're advocating for their course, they're often in the hospital, maybe in the CCU, figuring out what you can do kind of while they're waiting, which is medications, devices, things like that. All right. So we're going to all, I'll try to do that right now. You're all part of the team. Welcome. So we're going to go through a case. And this case is going to be basically, you have a, a patient, Mr. A. He's 55. He's got ischemic cardiomyopathy, listed for transplant. And he's not an ideal candidate because he has a mechanical mitral valve. He's had two sternotomies. He's been awaiting transplantation with an axillary impella 5.5 due to refractory shock and intermittent BT. First time he had an impella, it was in there for five weeks, and then the device just shorted out for whatever reason, so it had to be stopped. 
Unfortunately, during that time when it was stopped, which was only about six hours, had a bunch of VT, started developing renal injury, started developing hepatic injury. So they kind of declared themselves this is something that we really need to kind of go on forward. So that we're on our second impella. You're anticipating at least two more months as the current status. But unfortunately, you're now noting that there's, there's complications of the device. Device-related hemolysis, thrombocytopenia. This is, you know, is, there's the do-no-harm aspect. Is this helping them or is this hurting them? We got to factor that in. So this is, uh, admittedly, the device-related hemolysis and thrombocytopenia is a little rare for the Impella 5.5, but just, you know, humor me here, and this is what we're going we're gonna to deal with. So all together, question for the audience, would you replace the Impella for a third time? Just a show of hands. Just like, would anyone replace the Impella? Dr. Vader. Cool. Kylie. OK. All right. So for anyone, really, what if this person has a stroke? This, is, this changes the game. Does any, would anyone replace the Impella at this point or offer kind of other things? Kylie, you said no. Kylie, why, why would you say no? How, how big is the stroke? Great question. Let's imagine it's a pretty large stroke. Okay. I would have goals of care in the conversation. OK, goals of care conversations. Thank you, Edward. All right, so yeah, so goals of care conversation. So she mentioned the size of the stroke is a factor into it, and we'll get into that a little bit more later. All right, someone else. What if this patient develops renal failure? You know, it's dual organ failure. Anyone want to say whether they would or would not? Tony, what do you think? I would ask about the renal failure related to the, the heart. Okay. And then fixing the heart would fix the renal failure. Okay. It's two separate things, and okay. So it'd be more of a conversation rather than kind of yes, no question. Okay, great. Um, anyone want to chime in? Do you think hospital costs should do or should weigh into this conversation? I'm seeing some no's, no yeses, so probably, maybe not. And then uh, also, any other factors that are at play? And this one again, um, who am I going to pick on? Clay, hi. What other factors do you think could be at, at play here? Oh, I'll get a mic. Yeah. Uh, I feel like conversations related to mechanical support and heart transplant often take into account like a broad social kind of evaluation too of the patient and yeah. you know, their likelihood to follow up in clinic and do all the things that need to be done. Awesome. After yes. that's offered. There are other factors maybe beyond the medical aspect, and this is what's weighed in when these ha these discussions happen. So this is Mr. A. He's made up. Uh, he's not real. So I was curious about this, and thank you all for the, the uh, being voluntold to participate. So honestly, I was wondering, as everyone does, what does, what does Paul Meal think about this? Right? Everyone's favorite psychologist from the 60s. Who is Paul Meal? Paul Meal is a psychologist that back in the 50s argued that Everything that we're doing now, like subjective medicine, subjective clinical work, is actually outdated. Eventually, stats, algorithms, lab values, computers will figure this out. We don't have to talk about this stuff anymore. We just put it in the machine, the machine shoots out an answer, and it's right every time. So can we apply this now? Can we, can we put in all these, these factors that are discussed about and argued for and basically get rid of the ethics and just say, can we just do it? So when I was thinking about this and discussing with my dad, who's a psychologist, who told me about who Paul Meal was, obviously I had no idea, um, he was saying that basically we have, this, we have the algorithms that work really well, way better than they did 70 years ago. A very popular one right now is AI. So my thought is, could AI, if you plug in the answer, if you plug in the question, come up with the same answer that a whole t team was and basically forego this entire process that is complicated? I'm already seeing some no's. It's probably a good idea. All right, so what does AI say? So I basically just plugged it into the, the three most popular AI networks, the exact same question that I asked all of you. ChatGPT kind of gave a stupid answer, and they were like, you should thoroughly evaluate the patient. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Microsoft's version of this uh, was said, you know, you should consult with experts. Cool. 
Uh, open evidence, which is a little bit more medically minded, I think it's, it's Harvard and MIT's combined. Um, this one was citing a bunch of papers about the rates of things and everything, but ultimately came to the same decision. We're not gonna, we're computers, we're not gonna say yes or no, this patient should get a heart. The liability of that is probably insane, so they say please consult with the multidisciplinary team. So, we're gonna apply what they can do to an ethics workup. Fact finding and alternatives, they're computers. They can just do this pretty much instantly. Um, assessing alternatives, open evidence, cited some papers, Microsoft cited some papers, chat GPT, just guessed. And they're not really developing a plan or identifying any prevention steps. They're just coming up with uh, the idea of what the next most likely thing to say is. And then, so this is our AI colleagues, you know, our robots that are here with us in our short sleeve white coat in the operating theater. Um, I don't think we're quite there yet. I don't think that's, that's kind of the point, that we're not really quite there yet. So, in summary, please ask your doctor if you think third impella is right for you. And I love this picture, and I'm gonna take a minute to talk about it. Um, AI came up with this. This is what AI thinks it looks like. It is a, a very sad robot. This is, the saddest, this is the saddest robot I've ever seen. It is in the job rejection office, <laughs> getting a job rejection, and to hammer home the point, they didn't get the job. That broke my heart. <laughs> These robots can feel, and they're in cool short sleeve <laughs> light coats. So this is what AI thinks it looks like, but ultimately, I asked an expert, Dr. Vader, thanks for coming. I hope you are okay with me using your name. If not, I'm too late for that, <laughs> that's all right. <laughs> so um, the idea is that really this is just one of the, the many physicians that is gonna be doing these kind of decisions. This is one person's opinion at one time for a fake case. So all the disclaimers, there's absolutely no, let's just pretend this is Dr. Smith. This is Dr., you know, whatever. Okay. He said, yes, I would consider another Impella if otherwise a stable candidate, which I think some of y'all were already saying. Like if this, if this is the only thing that's going on, we can put in a third impella and we can kind of make those decisions going forward, provided that we're coming to that same conclusion. Kylie mentioned the size of the stroke. So if he has a stroke that's large enough, there could be ischemic conversion on bypass. That is a huge issue, especially when someone is kind of in a tenuous state. So it might be, might be revisiting this idea of saying, this is a development, this is a complication, this is someone that maybe is no longer uh, going down this path. Um, the renal failure question I thought was really interesting because from a dual organ transplant center, strangely, this could be a actually more preferable way to approach this from a regulatory perspective. This is just, it's based on kind of a systems process that I had really no idea about. And it's just maybe a better, better chance of getting dual organ for this patient. Hospital costs don't weigh in. And the thing that I thought was the, probably the most impactful part of what Dr. Vader said is that poor transplant survival is going to likely lead to program probation. This is the core of the justice issue because if you're unable to, to do these transplants in this region, Barnes being of course an area that covers a wide you know, section of America, you're now limiting a whole swath of people to get this access to this kind of care. That also is going to be not great for the, the staff and the physicians and the providers and everyone, and there's going to be net job satisfaction, but I thought the most poignant part of this is that first and foremost, we're trying to not do any harm. That is the oath, that's the Hippocratic Oath, that is the impactful part here. So, this is something that has to be weighed in. This is not a yes-no answer. So, let's apply it to the ethics workup. Basically, it's the same thing we were talking about. We're saying all the fact-finding, all the alternatives, but importantly, in, in his paragraph, that comorbidities were mentioned, professional standards, consequences, justice, special obligations, self-interest, general moral constraints, all these things are already getting done when you think about these things in a set time. And when you have more people all contributing their thoughts, you're really painting a complete picture. You're making the most ethical choice for the patient given their specific concerns. So for this case, and again, this is not a real person, I'm going to go yes for the Impella and make sure that we can do this for more people. So, let's, go, let's close the case. This is a difficult case on purpose. This was made by a heart failure cardiologist at Baylor, Dr. Fedson, and who's also an ethicist, so this is not easy. This is not kind of a yes-no thing. 
Right now it seems like probably let's do a third Impella, but let's keep an eye out for any complications. And there's a lot of disagreement. There's no one person that's gonna say yes the same time every single time. I'm not saying that that means that we should all start using AI. AI clearly isn't ready for that. But when it comes to you know, making a decision, and I love this, first off, no glove, holding a heart, and Impella is a, uh, it looks like a pill bottle with a tube coming out of it, which is not at all what an Impella looks like. So um, this is just one example of mechanical circulatory support, but it's important when we're factoring in kind of the bigger picture here. So uh, to steal from, I think it's the Daily Show, a moment of zen, this is something else that Dr. Vader mentioned. So concept of heart failure, I thought this was incredibly poignant and kind of gets to the point of this entire talk. This is a fidelity to the recipient, advocating for the best outcome, patient perceived outcomes may unfortunately be unachievable or unrealistic, it's to the donor for the utility of the organ, whether they give the gift of life that should not be squandered, either by the physicians by choosing the person well, or by the recipients for taking care of themselves, and this is all part of a dynamic. And also to the regional society, this really gets to that distributive justice, cease to operate jeopardize the ability for patients with limited financial and social resources to be transplanted, leading to inequitable distribution of organs, which would be really not great. That would be a really unfortunate outcome going forward. So that's why it's kind of an ongoing you know, search for this maintaining ethical fidelity. Okay, so in conclusion, so I think the big point here is really that any ethical situation, I picked heart failure just because that's my, my interest, but you should be strategic in how you approach it, any type of ethical situation, because that's gonna ultimately make sure that you're methodical and measured and are making sure that the patient gets the best care. Everyone's part of the team, even the robot, even AI in the background, maybe not ready for the limelight, but it's all part of it, so we're all working together, we're all doing this on behalf of patients, so just making sure ethics are kind of a key here. So, at this point, we talked about the one, you know, the ethical workup, there's a wide variety, there's important ethical factors, so this time for real. Thank you, everyone, for uh, participating and for their contributions and their thoughts, and uh, yeah, let me know if you have any questions and kind of kind of go from there. And we'll save questions until after uh, our second speaker just to, to keep things flowing. Next, we have Dr. Kylie Clevenger. Uh, she comes from the University of Arkansas where she studied biology and psychiatry and then stayed there for medical school to get her MD as well as a master's in public health before starting here as a resident just a couple years ago. Uh, she's also applying to cardiology, so we have two future fantastic cardiology, cardiologists with us. Um, and Dr. Clevenger, please, please introduce Dr. Clevenger. Please welcome. Okay, is this working? Oh, I can hear myself, perfect. By the way, my name is Dr. Clevenger, but it's okay. <laughs> okay, hi there everyone. Like he said, my name is Kylie, and today I'll be talking about a topic that is very near and dear to my heart and something that I think is very relevant to everyone in this room, and a lot of you may have a personal experience in this, um, so some of this will be a review, but I really love talking about stuff like this. So, I have no disclosures, and Really, I wanna talk about why is this even important? Why am I talking about this topic? So when I think we're talking about student-run free clinics or other alternative models like health fair or street med, it's like, why is that even important? Why do we need that? And I think one way to kind of think about this is first looking at access to care. A great website I always reference is the Healthy People 2030 website. This is by the Offices of Disease Prevention and Health Promotion. I really love their website because they get a lot of goals for us and then they gauge and take a lot of statistics on how we're doing on those goals. So just some fast facts I pulled from the website. It's about one in 10 people in the US are uninsured. Only 8.5% of adults 35 years or older received all the recommended clinical preventative services in 2015. Now, of course, that could be some people just you know declining colonoscopy or delaying their pap smears, which I'm sure many of us have done, but you know it's still a pretty interesting statistic. I think the thing that was most shocking to me on the website is that somewhere in between six to nine percent of people are delaying or totally avoiding care 
due to cost issues. And that could be seeing a physician or medications. And you know, I think that's a really important statistic when we think about access. But that was kind of like in the US. I think it's important to think about Missouri as well. So there's a ton of different ways to measure healthcare access. This is just one of many ways. This is a really great image that I took from uh, the Center for Health Policy. Basically those light tan areas are considered medically underserved areas and the darker tanny orange, whatever you wanna call that, is a medically underserved population. So I just think this is a really great map to illustrate that we have a lot of people that are considered medically underserved. Now, that's just one way to measure it. Like I said, there's also this map here about healthcare access, looking at health professional shortage areas. So the map on the left, the kind of lighter one there, that is actually estimating the population that's underserved, where the lighter the color, the less the population, and the darker the color, the greater the underserved population. So you might look at that one and say, well, that's not that bad, right? Like, that, we're doing pretty good. Well, another way to look at that actually is the health professional shortage area score, which is a very fancy calculation that basically looks at things like population to provider ratio, the percent of the population below the 100% federal poverty level, and essentially gives you a score between zero and 25. And this score is used to kind of calculate and really determine what areas have the most shortage and are the highest priority to get healthcare professionals there. So the darker the color, the higher the score. So if you look at it from that way, we have a lot of areas that really, really need health providers there. One thing I wanna point out here though is this map is actually just looking at primary care. This is not looking at specialty care, dental care, mental health care. This also doesn't show or tell you anything about what is the distance to care, what's the quality of that care, how affordable is that care? It's not commenting on any of those things. So this is just one measure of access. And one statistic that I found really interesting here is the Missouri State Health Assessment in 2023 did a survey asking people, do you feel like you have good health care in your community? And 16% of Missourians disagreed with that. So let's talk about barriers though. You know, there are a lot of barriers to care. Some of these might not be surprising. You know, vast majority of people said, too costly, that was the most common one. It was 43% of people said it was too costly. What about insurance? Well, that's also a big barrier as well. But I think this also shows some really important things that we might not consider. Unsure how to receive care. I mean, have any of you tried to use the Cigna website to find a PCP? If anybody figures it out, let me know because I still don't have a PCP as a third year here. Um, did not feel welcome, too far away, issues with transportation, childcare, and the provider doesn't speak my language. And I think these are all really important because at Barnes, we're really lucky here that we have excellent interpreters, we have social workers in clinic that are available to help us with these things. But of course, in smaller clinics and smaller areas that don't have these resources, that could be a huge barrier to care to patients. But how are we doing? You know, that was a little comment on access, but how are we doing in terms of our healthcare performance? So I'm gonna be a little unfair here. This is actually some data from COVID, so kind of our worst of our worst. But this is essentially a graphic I took from the, um, the Commonwealth Fund where they came up with a scorecard for all the states. And they basically put all these fancy calculations here in all these different categories. And then they said, okay, if you're in the green, you did above average. If you're in the orange to red, you did below average. And they ranked us. So it's kind of small, but where's Missouri? Right there. We're ranked 47th. Woo, good job, Missouri. Um, so after COVID, we actually jumped up to 38th, but I did want to comment, you know, we're not doing too hot compared to the other states. And I'm gonna talk about Arkansas later because that's where I'm from. So Arkansas is right there. But like I said, we did bump up to 38th, so we had some improvements. Now, I don't wanna go into this. I just put this here if you're interested, but a little bit of detail I wanted to point out is that in terms of income disparity, we were actually the worst. We were the absolute worst in terms of income disparity in Missouri. Now, we actually did okay on access and affordability. That was one of our best things, which I found that pretty shocking. So there's a lot of really good information if you guys are interested in this. Um, the Commonwealth Fund has a lot of good stuff, and then obviously, um, you know, the offices of disease and you know, CDC and all those great websites. So another way to kind of think about access and how we're doing and performance is health indicators. So, you know, we have very similar leading causes of death to the US, heart disease, cancer, chronic lower respiratory disease. One thing that I found kind of interesting is that among the 15 leading causes of death in Missouri, Missouri rates were higher in 13 of those 15, which might not be a shocking uh, number here, but other things I wanted to talk about is that 11.4% of our population is uninsured, and you know that number goes up and down depending what year you look at, but also our life expectancy has been below the national average since 2011, 2011. 
And then infant mortality rate, we're also ranked 31st. And one thing that we don't have a ton of time to get into in this topic, though I wish I could, I love talking about stuff like this and educating people on this, but there are huge health disparities and racial disparities in a lot of these health indicators. And so I think that's really something to keep in mind as we move forward. So to kind of summarize here, access to care is a high priority national issue. Missouri has a significant number of medically underserved areas and health professional shortage areas. And we face, you know, Missourians face numerous barriers to care. And we rank poorly in a lot of ways. So basically this all just says gaps in care. So that's why this topic is important. So we're gonna talk about alternative models of healthcare delivery. Now, I set my sights really high when I made the title of this talk. Unfortunately, we're not gonna have time to go into all this stuff, but we're gonna spend most of our time talking about student-run free clinics because that is where I have a lot of experience. And some of you have, may have volunteered. Anybody volunteered at a student-run free clinic? Yeah, okay, so like vast majority of you have, so that's fabulous. Okay, so a little bit of overview for those that don't know. It's a method of providing care to underserved patients while educating healthcare trainees. Majority focus on outpatient adult medicine, and we don't have a lot of data on you know, these clinics, but one really interesting uh, you know, line of data I found was in 2014, at least 75% of medical schools had at least one student-run free clinic for a total of 208 student-run free clinics that saw at least 140,000 patients annually. And that was in 2014. Like, that's impressive. I feel like we probably have a lot more now. Also, this is just looking at MD granting of uh, med schools. And then these are very variable. And I'm gonna show you like five or six tables in a row, just work with me here. Um, I'll point out the important things, but I wanted to give you guys the information in case you're interested. So these are some statistics from that 2014 article. Really what I wanna highlight here is that these clinics are very, very small. You know, they're seeing 15 patients per clinic session. They're maybe only open one to two times a week. Most of them only have five clinic rooms. They're only open for four hours. I mean, these are very small clinics. And how long are they waiting and how long are these visits? Well, it's about 40 minutes of wait time and about 100 minutes of total visit length. And I don't know how it was at your clinics, but at our clinics, uh, sometimes visits were four hours, five hours. And we'll talk about why later. And then attending faculty per clinic session, only two. Only two, that's a lot of staffing to do. But a few other things I found impressive is that majority of medical students at these med schools actually participated in these clinics. And another not shocking fact is that budgets can vary a ton. You know, the average was about 50,000 here. So, so a few more stats I found really interesting is that vast majority of these clinics do not offer any sort of academic credit. And are these faculty getting funded for their roles in these clinics? No, they most certainly are not. Only about 16% are getting funded for their time. And I think that's really important because I'll talk more about the clinic I worked with, but uh, essentially, and Clay can vouch for me on this because we went to the same med school, uh, the attending and the clinical director, they were there four nights a week for four to five hours or whenever we were done. They almost never missed. And so they spend a significant amount of their clinical time doing things like this until 9 p.m., 9 p.m., 10 p.m. at night, okay? Really the most interesting thing here that gets back to access is that 92% of clinics, about 93%, they're providing this care entirely free of charge. And greater than 80% of patients are under the 100% of federal poverty level. That's a really interesting statistic. So again, majority of these clinics are providing care to very highly underserved patients. You know, 54% of the clinics had a patient population with greater than 90% uninsured. And I think, you know, when you think about these clinics and why they're useful, there's a lot of different ways to look at it, but one thing I really think is cool is that they have a lot of interprofessional partners. These clinics are actually more interprofessional than even some of ours. And so a lot of them have pharmacists, nurses, social workers, dentists, lawyers. They have a lot of students. I mean, 73% of them have pre-health students, which I think is pretty impressive. But one thing that I thought was really interesting is how many have dental and legal students. I mean, it's really a one-stop shop, which we'll talk more about later. And then in terms of services offered, this can be hugely variable, hugely variable. All of them focus on outpatient adult medicine, essentially. But if like in our clinic, we had a medicine pediatrics uh, attending, and so we did also pediatrics, so a few people do that. Almost all of them have social workers and interpreters, or at least majority, and then a lot of them have psychology and counseling. Some even do medical procedures. We did not do that in our clinic that much, but I you know, think it's important to consider. And then one thing I wanted to highlight here is a, 
a decent amount also had legal services. And I went and actually looked at a few of the student-run free clinics websites, and really the legal services tend to be about immigration law or things related to domestic violence and you know family planning and things of that nature. So these really can have a broad variety of resources for patients. The other thing I found really interesting is how many have specialty consults, and I'm not exactly sure how this comes to be. I guess it's just you know one provider or one specialty, you know, agrees to kind of join one of these clinics and that's what starts it, but a lot of these clinics even offer very highly specialized fields. One even offered rheumatology, neurology, OBGYN. We had OBGYNs at our clinic, and I think this is really impressive. And so now I just want to give some data in terms of medications and pharmacy. So 72% of student-run free clinics provide medications totally free of charge. That's pretty impressive. You know, at our clinic, we would write prescriptions and try and choose things on the $4 Walmart list, but some people are getting things totally free of charge. And then how many of them have patient assistance programs? About 53%. And 52% actually have an on-site pharmacy, which is really convenient. I mean, has anybody, well, do you all remember when you first went to the co? And imagine being a patient, it was there the first time, and you had to park in the garage, you know, 10 minutes away, and then walk to the fourth, the second floor, and then go to get labs on the fourth floor, and then go to the CAM to get imaging and your medications. It can be very complex, so it's really nice that they have the pharmacy right there on site for the patients. They do offer a lot of labs as well. You know, almost 70% of clinics have blood draw on site, which is really convenient. These are just a list of some of the most common labs here. And then the next slide is gonna be really shocking. Please don't ask me any follow-up questions because I don't know because it was not included in this data. But 53% of clinics offered, you know, radiographs and 56 had ultrasound. That's pretty impressive. The CT and MRI, I don't know if that means on-site, if that means it was totally free, if there was a limit to how many they had. Unfortunately, that was not in the article from 2014. But I can say at our clinic, we did not have any of that. Uh, but I still find it impressive. So to summarize the benefits here, I think there's a lot of benefits to these clinics. Hopefully, you've kind of come up with some on your own. Majority provide care entirely free of charge to a very highly underserved patient population. I think that's the biggest benefit right there. No, I, I really don't need to go into the rest, but the other things are there are unfortunately not a lot of studies on this topic, but it may help reduce hospital utilization and healthcare cost, which is, you know, that's a, that's a good motivator as well. And one study, I mean, it was just a model and an estimation study, but a simulation estimated that one student-run free clinic actually translated to $850,000 of savings for a local community. So, you know, more room to, to study that. But the other thing I find really useful is that because of these clinics and their size, they can have direct collaboration with community partners to meet specific needs. So, for example, some of these student-run free clinics offer tutoring for, for children. Some of them offer free reading programs for children, and that's after direct feedback from the community. I was talking about the one-stop shop and also how long our clinic visits were at 12th Street Health and Wellness Center, the clinic I worked at. So for example, a patient could be there for regular diabetes follow-up, and during that diabetes follow-up, we would do their diabetic retinopathy screening. I would draw their blood work, and they would have the dietitian come in and counsel them immediately. If they had any mental health concerns, they could get counseling same night with an interpreter. If they had any hearing concerns, okay, go to our audiology room and get your hearing checked. You have a dental concern? Well, great. We have a dental chair right over around the corner. So we could really get a lot done in one place. Our clinic also offered, uh, we had a garden, and so we had free, fresh fruits and vegetables for patients to take on their way out. We also had free hygiene products and free books for kids. So this can really kind of just, these are highly variable, like I said, and kind of meet the, meet the needs of the community. But one thing I really wanted to highlight is this also reduces burdens of scheduling and transportation. You know, you see a patient for diabetes and then you say, okay, well, you need a di diabetic eye screening. Well, now I have to refer you to optometry and that visit's gonna be in six months and you gotta get transportation for that too, et cetera. Whereas here, you know, just walk on over. We'll do the screen right now. Some challenges though. You know, that's all good and well, but some challenges. Longer wait and visit times. Difficulty with sufficient faculty staffing as most of these people are not getting any sort of funding for their work. Clinic funding is a big deal. And then a lot of logistical issues such as scheduling limitations, location, documentation. You know, I didn't highlight this, but almost half have an EHR, but not all of them do. And these certainly are not epic and not in care everywhere. Uh, insurance, legal issues, and these are more volatile. A lot of these clinics had to shut down during COVID, including ours. 
And then the next slides, I wanted to show you some pictures of the clinic that I use. Now, these are out-of-date pictures. I took these myself. This is the UAMS 12th Street Health and Wellness Center. This is in Arkansas. And I just wanted to show you pictures of what the clinic looked like so you could kind of get a vibe for what it looks like. So in this picture here, I mean, that looks like a cubicle, right? Like there, there's not really a ton of patient privacy there. Uh, these are very multidisciplinary rooms, and so you'll have five or six, you know, med students and PA students in that room. Then we have our dental chair, and we have our lab right here. So everything was very close, very small. A little bit of data about 12th Street is it was open several nights a week from about 4 to 8 p.m., sometimes later. I will say this data could be out of date because this was years ago now. But we had a lot of different students. I know I mentioned audiology, but we also had public health, dental hygiene, pharmacy, social work, pretty good variety. In terms of services, we offered a very broad variety of services that I kind of already talked about and those additional resources I highlighted. But this is really just to illustrate that there's a lot of variety. For example, the pro bono clinic here that Dr. Ludi helps with, they're open on Friday afternoons and they offer PTOT, which we did not have. And they're more in a, a gym structure, whereas ours was a pro bono um, clinic building that was donated. So I got too excited when I set my topic title. Uh, we unfortunately don't have a ton of time to talk about other models, but I wanna briefly highlight some that you can you know, get exposure to while you're here, health fairs. So obviously people know a lot about health, health fairs, you've seen them, it's an opportunity to reach patients often at community centers and often at free of cost. Really these can be highly variable, there's not a lot of studies on these, but some reports say, you know, depending on the size of the health fair that 100 people can show up for one, one experience. And I think the common issues here and ethical concerns as well is follow up and what if they have active complaints? What do you do then? And I don't know if anybody has participated with the Health Protection and Education Services, but according to their website, they actually served 700 patients in 2023, 81% of them being non-English speaking. And they even offer things like blood glucose, lipid panels, things of that nature. And so these can be very broad health screenings like that, or it can actually be very focused, like the Mammavan, which our Mammavan actually came to 12th Street Health and Wellness Center too, so we could get people mammograms on the same night as well. Now street medicine, we don't have a ton of time to talk about street medicine either, but this is an opportunity to provide care to unhoused patients direct, directly. It really eases access to care for a stigmatized population, and it helps reduce healthcare utilization costs, health utilization cost. The other thing to think about here is there's a lot of challenges. Funding being the biggest one, medications and supplies, a lack of an EHR, liability coverage, Really, I just wanted to highlight this because we have this here as well in St. Louis Street Med by Dr. Nathan Nolan. He kind of told me a bit about his experience. They go out on every Saturday and they often treat complications of drug use, but they respond to a wide variety of health complaints. And so if anybody's more interested in health protection education services or Street Med St. Louis, I recommend you look at their websites because they have a lot of really good information about what they do. So to kind of summarize everything we talked about and some important considerations, First, I want to highlight, and this kind of goes back to what Justin was talking about. So in terms of equity and ethics and things of that nature, you know, these models, they do help bridge gaps in care and they strive to offer resources to help meet patient needs and address social determinants of health, but they do not replace standard comprehensive care models. And I really can't comment on the quality of the care offered at these locations because there's not a lot of studies on it and that even within these models, there are significant health disparities and inequities. You know, I think that's something really important to consider. And there's obviously room for improvement. And then of course, we're limited on time, so I couldn't talk about, you know, this is a, I could teach a whole class on this. You know, I would love doing that with my MPH, uh, but if you're more interested in additional resources, you can check out my citations at the end. And so to kind of summarize everything we talked about, access to care is a high priority issue nationally and in Missouri. There are numerous barriers to care, some of which can help be addressed by, via alternative healthcare delivery models. Student-run free clinics provide an important service to medically underserved patients with the benefit of oftentimes being totally free of care and kind of in one place, but they also face a lot of challenges such as funding, staffing, and follow-up care. So these models, like I said, they help bridge gaps in care, but they do not replace standard comprehensive care models, and they can still exhibit health inequities. So I'd like to thank the Chiefs from last year for inviting me to give this talk. Also the Chiefs from this year, but last year too. Um, I also want to thank Dr. Ludi and Dr. Nolan who both uh, shared their experiences with me at their free clinics and alternative models. 
And then I want to thank 12th Street Health and Wellness Center, specifically Drs. Melissa Halverson and Elizabeth Gath, who dedicate majority of their time to the clinics. And then also Dr. Beth Bryant for looking over my, <laughs> my PowerPoint. So here are my references, and I'll get to the most important slide for those of you uh, that need this, the, the CME. All right, thank you so much. bit and we have time for questions so maybe I'll start um, when you were talking about the ethics of, of uh, heart transplantation and how you make these decisions the um, the impact of the patient's quality of life and the patients and families wishes in terms of um, their goals of care their resources and support needed could you address that a little bit because that that wasn't explicitly called out in your ethics evaluation where the, the patients and families weigh in there. Yeah, so uh, great question. I think that is something that comes a lot of times in these kind of ongoing goals of care conversations. Um, for me, I think in terms of the workup, the part that is kind of the most salient aspect of when you're assessing the alternatives is those legitimate self-interests. I think that's kind of the point where you know, it's what pro the providers want to offer. It's also what the patients and, you know, when they're at the center of all of this, this is their legitimate self-interest, but also that can apply to their families. And there can be com conflicts and, you know, disagreements among that. So I think when, you know, you're doing the fact-finding part of it, if there's any disagreements that should be, like, focused on, that should be trying to figure out where the conflict is, approaching it really methodically so that you can make sure that you're not leaving any stone unturned and everyone gets their point across and ultimately make the most you know, holistic approach to the, the patient. Great, thanks. Other questions? So, so I, I have a student run free clinic question sure. for you. I, I think it is really wonderful in the amount of effort that, that students and, and faculty put into maintaining these clinics is really important. One of the challenges, linkages to care and then how do you really foster longitudinal and ongoing care versus episodic care. So what do you think we could be doing to improve either linkages to care or longitudinal care um, and, and continue to support the experiences for students in, in free clinic centers? Yeah, that's a really, really good question. And of course, longitudinal care and follow-up is a really hard thing to focus on. Luckily, in the student-run free clinic population, at least at our clinic, we did have a lot of continuity. Uh, we did majority scheduled patient visits, and there were patients that I saw all four years of med school, of course, except when we were shut down from COVID. So we did have a lot of continuity. I think you know, getting people referred and then kind of being a one-stop shop for them. And a lot of our patients in Arkansas, they were immigrants and they only spoke Spanish and they were uninsured and so the continuity was there mainly because they didn't have other options in terms of following up and what if they needed extra things uh, luckily our clinic providers and directors coordinated with UIMS to sometimes provide pro bono care if a higher level of care was needed but in terms of you know health fairs I think that's really difficult you know the health protection and education services after you uh, you know, see a patient if anything's abnormal and they need follow-up, you know, if their A1C is 13, what do you do? You don't, are you going to start them on medications right then? I think it's really tough. But you can actually send referrals out from there. You know, you can, as a physician, write that you think they need a referral, and then um, the, the staff there follows that up. And then in terms of street medicine, I know it's really hard. I don't want to speak on behalf of Dr. Nolan and his efforts, but um, I know that he communicates with some of his, his patients via text to help continue that, that relationship and continuity. But of course, that's a a challenge in the unhoused population because they don't have access to an outlet, outlet or things like that to charge phones, and it can be really difficult to follow follow up with patients. So, in terms of things we can do to improve continuity, I think really making sure we're meeting the actual patient's needs and providing the resources. You know, I think showing them that you care and getting them the things that they actually find important, just not things that you as the physician find important, is a great way to kind of foster that relationship and, and maintain that continuity of care. I think getting Epic for or electronic health records for all of them would be helpful too. This is not sponsored by Epic, but. <laughs> Thanks. Thank Other you. Questions?
repeat the question so that when it gets on the recording, they can yeah. hear it too? Yeah. Um, thanks, Dr. Bader. Thank you for coming. Um, I, the question is basically, is there any formalized ethics curriculum that is, exists currently and could be instrumented in a way that is applicable to these advanced heart failure fellowships or just anyone else that's doing these types of things? I actually don't know. Uh, I would hope so. I, and if not, let's well, talk. I, I let's, can let's, probably let's help you it. out here, and I think there are other people that are actively engaged in undergraduate medical education here also. So there is a big component of ethics in the current new gateway curriculum that is addressed with cases. There's also ethics training that's mandated for all of our MSCI students and all of our clinical investigators. We have a Center for Health Ethics Research here that's embedded in the Division of General Medicine and Geriatrics that's run by uh, Dr. James Dubois. So, um, and we have a number of medical ethicists and there's a hospital-based ethics uh, program and clinic still that works for consults for difficult cases. So I think we definitely could create a linkage for you to build that curriculum in for the fellowship program in cardiology and the heart failure program. And I'm pretty sure there is an ethics um, aspect of the required curriculum for all resident program as well. Thanks. Other questions? Francis? Ed, uh, what am I doing? So this see, is I'm following your like using <laughs> wrong names. This is for Dr. Clevenger. Um, you mentioned in the beginning of your talk how part of the issue with access to care is actually location, that the areas that are more underserved tend to be more rural, away from major centers. Uh, the student run free clinics, though, are em employ, quote unquote, medical students who are at major academic centers where they're getting their education. So are there any efforts in using these clinics to try to get farther out into more rural areas and kind of what other options do they have with regards to these student run for you clinics? Yeah, that's a really good question. And honestly, I think that's one of the greatest challenges too, because the way to get funding and volunteers is by being coordinated with an academic center or, you know, having students. And, you know, I don't think there's honestly a lot of good resources out there to help meet those kind of needs. And I think that's what's even more challenging. I think most of these clinics kind of focus on, you know, underserved populations within the city, but there's certainly a lot of room for improvement in the rural areas as well. I know that a lot of the clinics actually through the social workers and the social work students will offer like transportation. I know even in the 2014 study, people were doing uh, like Uber or like cab rides and vouchers and things like that for patients that were a little bit further out. But I think that's still a huge challenge. And you know, even if we meet the needs of the city through these clinics, we're not meeting the needs of, of rural clinics. I do know that some of these med schools that were mentioned in the study do have multiple clinics, and I think some of them are further out for that reason. But I do then wonder, you know, are they only open once a month or once a week then? You know, our clinic was nice in the sense that it was open on evenings, so it was more flexible. However, you know, we, nobody was there during the day. So that raises more questions on like scheduling concerns or walk-in appointments and follow follow up, you know, and, and so I think that's a really good question. I would love to do something like that. I think it'd be really fun, but uh, it would be hard to do, hard to set up. Great question. So just to chime in so people are aware, Siteman Cancer Center has huge rural outreach efforts that are involved with investigators in reducing cancer mortality and improving cancer outcomes and equity improving diagnosis with mobile mammography vans, but also colorectal screening across Missouri and Illinois that have been phenomenally successful as well. Those followed some urban efforts initially in North County that made a big difference. And then there's a big program with HIV and STI outreach and prevention and screening through the infectious disease and HIV programs that students and residents could get engaged with as well that have really good outcomes. And the CTSA has a partnership with University of Missouri to look at rural health and outcomes through telehealth and other um, kind of uh, um, peer outreach um, with nurses and public health workers and uh, social workers also that's engaged with mobile 
you know, transportation and, and telehealth care. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a, a really, the oh yes, so the question, well, I don't know if I can summarize it that well because it was a good question, but essentially some people at, uh, you know, other places might take years off to provide this care as students and things like that, and basically as academic medical centers, you know, how much of a responsibility do they have to kind of support these student-run free clinics and similar efforts? Is that fair enough? Okay, perfect. So, you know, I think that's a really good question because I'll actually say, um, at least in terms of my career, the student-run free clinic is probably when I've actually felt I've done the most, and I would love to continue doing things like that. I felt like I did more for my patients in two hours there than sometimes I've done after seeing them six times in the co. And I think that's a challenge both for me and then you know other people that feel similarly, and of course we do the best we can. I do sometimes wish we had more support, and again, I don't wanna speak for the people that do the pro bono clinic or the street med, but I know there's a lot of challenges with funding, and they do, um, you know, I think a lot of times that stuff ends up coming out of pocket and out of their free time and they're not funded and then they face like issues with liability coverage and malpractice and things of that nature. I think that's a lot of burden on the providers directly. And I think that's really stressful and um, you know, it's hard to balance your academic responsibilities with, with those responsibilities that you find meaningful. And I think one thing that would be helpful is uh, you know, maybe a systematic way to get grants and funding to support people's endeavors in these efforts. And I think it's a great educational opportunity for students. You know, some of the studies show that students actually felt that these clinics addressed underserved areas really, really well. They had better interprofessional education. They felt their skills were better. And then also that, this, that these opportunities addressed parts of med school curriculums that were lacking. And, you know, I think academic credit for students would be nice. Um, and then funding for the attendings who want to participate, I think would be a really good way, and supplies and medications would be really nice. But, you know, I think it can be tough to manage all these different moving parts, but that's a really good question. Thank, Thank you. you both very much. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>